So we are going to uh, do a little bit more with gears today, and we're going to start approaching the question of stress in, uh, in gear teeth. Uh, and there's actually two different questions that typically comes up with respect to stress in gear teeth. One of them has to do with surface stresses. So uh, you might remember when we talked about uh, when two objects contact each other, uh, when they do that, there's actually a, a stress generated right in the surface of the part, and uh, it can cause uh, fatigue because one of the things that you don't get with a, with a surface stress effect is any kind of an endurance limit like you do with other kinds of stress. Um, that's actually the portion of today's talk that uh, is actually probably going to get pushed until our next lecture because this problem is probably going to be too long to be able to get through in one day, and so we're going to push that piece um, off till the next lecture. Today we're going to talk about bending stresses in gear teeth, which you can kind of probably picture in your mind that gear teeth are going to have to carry bending stresses. The idea that you have a, uh, a force that's applied at the tip of a, uh, you know, whatever a gear tooth might look like, the fact that you have a uh, force acting on the tip out here like this leads to kind of a bending action around some sort of a pivot point down here. And uh, that generates, you know, if I'm pushing that direction, it generates a little spot back here that probably has a tensile stress. And if you, you, if you get that tensile stress uh, high enough, then it will end up uh, yielding the material, and that's not a good thing. So we have to try to design our gears against failing in that way. Um, there's kind of an old standard of doing this, and it involves something that's called the Lewis equation. And I want to just sort of uh, talk about this in general terms, just so we kind of have in mind what's going on with the, uh, the bending question. So that's kind of the first uh, part of this question, actually. It says to find the bending stress in this thing using the Lewis equation. Here's what the Lewis equation does, basically, is it looks at a certain length um, they call it L, I believe, in the, in the textbook, but they basically have this length that's above this point around which you're expecting this bending to occur. There's also a thickness of the tooth, kind of an effective thickness down here where it matters. Okay. And, uh, and then here's another thing that's kind of strange about the analysis of these things, uh, of these gears. We will be using W as our force variable. That's different than in some of our other contexts where we've had to have forces. And I'll actually even put another little indicator on here that says W with a superscript of T. That is not W raised to the T. This is the notation that they use to talk about the tangential component of the stress that exists, in, or tangential component of the force that exists in the uh, tooth of a gear, okay? So that's a you know, one of the factors that we're going to have to use. Anyway, um, stress, and this is based on going all the way back to our very first uh, encounters with this, is going to be equal to mc over i, right? Okay, well, if you think about this, the moment that is generated is roughly going to be uh, w with a superscript of t times l, okay? C is going to be T over 2, and the uh, moment of inertia, the second moment of area uh, about the axis where the bending could occur uh, is based on uh, BH cubed over 12. You might remember that formula from back whenever we were doing bending stuff like this for rectangular uh, cross sections that were experiencing bending. And you know this is rectangular because in and out of the page, um, that, that is right here, you're going to create a rectangular, I can probably even sort of sketch it here, you're going to have this rectangular um, area of the tooth that is, you know, going to be experiencing the stress. Anyway, the point with that is that this BH cubed over 12 gives you I, and the B that we have here is actually, we kind of replace that variable as well, with the variable of capital F, okay? And that stands for face width. So that's the width of the face of the gear tooth. And so 
when we're finding this stress, we just basically take F, which corresponds with the base of BH cubed over 12. Um, the height is going to be T. Okay. And this ends up giving you our kind of our starting point for understanding stress in a uh, in the tooth of a gear. Now, here's what's tricky. How do you say exactly where the base of the tooth is? That's, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, there's also the question of how do you take data that you actually have about these teeth? Namely, one of the things that you a lot of times have is a diametral pitch. Uh, and diametral pitch relates to parameters like the thickness of the tooth and the length of the tooth. And so I'm not going to necessarily spend a lot of time going through their little derivation that they did uh, in the book, but we basically, the way this works is it comes down to another equation that is called the Lewis, um, you know, the Lewis bending equation for the tooth of a gear, and it is WT like this, uh, times the diametral pitch of the gear over the face width times this other factor that takes into account uh, a lot of the specific geometry that happens within a gear tooth, okay? And this Y factor that exists right here is called the Lewis form factor. Okay? And that is a, a value that can be uh, found without too much effort if you draw a picture of the actual gear tooth, you know, accurately draw that picture of the, of the actual gear tooth and do some work on it. Or it's also a value that is tabulated for a lot of different uh, types of, of gears. And you actually see that on the following page. So this, this equation right here uh, was equation 14.2. Uh, 14 Okay. Well, on the following page, we have Lewis form factors in another table, uh, table 14.2. Okay. And I just want to, you know, kind of show these things so that you see uh, this is the original way that people had to think about uh, the stress in gear teeth. And uh, we'll go ahead and do a quick problem using this, you know, these equations right here um, to figure out what the stress would be in uh, a setup like we have up here uh, that I haven't really spent a lot of time talking about, but we're going to use Lewis first and then we're going to transition into a more modern way of dealing with gears, which is based on a uh, procedure set up by the American Gear Manufacturers Association, which is what AGMA stands for. All right, so let me kind of talk through um, some of the specifics of this problem. I know there's a lot of information on here. The basic idea is that we have a 16 tooth gear that is mating with a 48 tooth gear. They do so with a 20 degree pressure angle. They also have a diametral pitch of six teeth per inch and a face width of two inches. So that's in and out of the page where I'm showing it right here. Um, they are straddle mounted, evenly spaced between bearings, we're just going to say it has a uh, quality of sort of a commercial, uh, you know, gearbox. Uh, it is enclosed. Um, we're going to be using grade one of steel with uncrowned shape for the teeth. All right. Um, and all of these factors, I have them all listed up here because these are all things that matter to us when we get into the actual uh, AGMA methodology of figuring out, you know, how much... Uh, factor of safety we have, for instance, with respect to bending stress, uh, and also with respect to uh, contact stress. So, but we'll have to push that until a little bit later time. All right, so we have accurately and rigidly mounted. We want a reliability of 90%. We want it to be able to transmit five horsepower with a uniform power profile, okay? So this basically means that we don't have large amounts of torque spikes. Right? It's going to be transmitting just a smooth, even amount of power, uh, five horsepower like this. Uh, we're going to use number six quality standards for the building of the teeth of the gear. And we will then say that the teeth of the gear uh, will have a Brunel hardness of 200. 
All right, so these are all factors that are going to play a part in this. So my first question is this, if we want to use the bending stress uh, equation, the, the Lewis equation for bending stress, what is it that we need? Okay, and go back to the Lewis equation that I had down here. Okay, what's W superscript T? That's a tangential force, okay? And one of the things that was done whenever they first set up this Lewis uh, bending equation was that there was a presumption that um, all of the load was gonna be put on the tip of the tooth because that was our worst case scenario for how much load a tooth could carry. So we'd put all the load on the tip of the tooth and then we would look at the tangential component of that only because the tangential component uh, leads to you know, kind of equal compressive stress on both sides of the, of the gear tooth. If we were to also look at the radial component, what effect would that have? Because that's, that's the way a, a force actually gets applied to a gear tooth, right, is both a tangential component and a radial component. So that would actually have the effect of putting more compressive stress in the tooth, and uh, it could end up actually making the tooth a little bit stronger in the direction that really mattered. Uh, but we're going to ignore the radial component of that force and look only at the tangential component. So uh, what I want to show you here is that our very first thing that we need to do if what we're given is a power and a speed. That's another thing I didn't mention is that we're saying that the 16 tooth gear is being driven at 300 RPM. One of the very first things we're going to need, uh, it, you know, and we'll use this for a number of different things, but one of the very first thing that we need is what's called a pitch line velocity. Okay. And so to find pitch line velocity, what we're going to do is uh, imagine here that we, you know, we know what the uh, linear speed is of a tooth. That's essentially what we mean by the pitch line velocity. And so to get that, we're going to get this pitch line velocity to be equal to 300 RPM. Okay. And in a revolution, how far does a tooth move? Okay. It'll probably need to be what? The diameter times pi gives you the circumference, right, of the circle, right? So if I could figure out the diameter of this gear, then I should be able to figure out how far the tooth moved in a revolution. All right, so that means that I can take uh, my 16 teeth, right, 16 teeth, and divide it by my diametral pitch, 6 teeth per inch, and what do I get in this set of parentheses right here? Okay. Yeah, it'll be two point, the number I think ends up being 2.667 uh, or so. But what I have conceptually here is the diameter, or the, I'll say the pitch diameter. Okay, is what I have inside of the parentheses right there. Okay. And if I take that and I multiply it by pi, then that gives me how far a tooth moves in one revolution, okay? Um, and then since this is per minute, it also tells me that's how far it moves per minute, right? Because it's revolutions per minute, all right? So the only other thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to convert this into feet per minute rather than in inches per minute because what we get out of this right now is inches per minute. Um, the reason I'm going to convert to feet per minute is that is a useful... Uh, you know, set of, of units to have the value in for some of the things that we will look up uh, in just a moment. So anyway, this pitch line velocity ends up being, whoop, I was going to multiply this, excuse me, by um, a foot per 12 inches like this. And this ends up giving me a pitch line velocity of 209.5. Uh, feet per minute. Okay, 
And we're going to use that for a number of different things uh, throughout the, the analysis of this. Here's one of the things we can use it for, though, is that it has a very nice relationship with power, okay? Because you might remember power is equal to force times velocity. And what we've basically come up with right here is a velocity with which a force is pushing on something to transmit power. So we're at exactly the right positioning to use this equation to find force if we know power and we also know velocity. Okay, so what we basically say here is that we have five horsepower is equal to the force that we are talking about here which actually, let me go ahead and use the variable that we talked about just a second ago. We'll just say that this is the force that's applied to the tooth. Uh, and this then would be multiplied by 209.5 feet per minute. Okay. Or what this actually tells me here is that this force, W superscript T, uh, is just equal to 5 horsepower over 209.5 feet per minute. Okay, a few things we probably want to do here with respect to units. First of all, what is a horsepower? Okay, a horsepower is 550 foot pounds per second. All right, that's in one horsepower. Okay, is that all I need to do, you think? Probably put in here again uh, 60 seconds per minute. And what that does is it allows me to cancel out minutes, cancel out seconds, and I end up with just pounds. Okay, and so this ends up giving me a tangential component of the force applied to the tip of the tooth of 787.6 uh, pounds. So the, the reason we didn't do that, the question was, when we calculate this velocity, did we not need to go to radians, okay? The reason we did not need to do that is we are directly using this idea that revolutions times circumference gives you distance, okay? So since we have revolutions per minute and then we have diameter times pi to get circumference, that is now an amount of distance traveled for the tooth per minute. So it's just a different way of doing it um, than using radians, okay? The other way you can do it is you can use radians uh, times radius. Right, and then that gives you the same thing. And actually you can prove that those two are equivalent to each other. All right, so 787.6 pounds, where do I use that? That again is the WT that I had down here for Lewis form factor. And what we're trying to do is figure out the stress experienced by this tooth using the Lewis bending equation. So now I have one parameter in there, 787.6 pounds. What's my, what's my diametral pitch? The capital P here is diametral pitch in the Lewis uh, equation. So what is that value? Six teeth per inch, okay, <clears throat> which I put that teeth in there. Teeth is not really a unit. Uh, but I'll put it in there just to kind of indicate that that's what it is. This actually is okay to kind of uh, just put it in here as one over inch because T is not a real unit. It's just counting up a certain number of things, okay? Um, and then what? Divide by my face width. What was the face width I had up here? Two inches. That's what that F is, so I have two inches. And then I need to put in my Lewis form factor, which you can find on table 14.2. If you have addition 10, if, uh, table 14.2 is on page 730. And if you look up the number of teeth, uh, 
Actually, first of all, let me just mention for table 14.2, you will notice that the, as the number of teeth increases, what happens with Lewis form factor? Okay, page 730, table 14.2, as number of teeth increases, the uh, value of Lewis form factor also increases. What happens to stress as Lewis form factor increases? It decreases. So based on this, where would we expect our worst case scenario to be between these two teeth, or be, between these two gears that I'm uh, talking about up here? Okay. So something in the denominator is increasing, and that makes the value decrease, right, as the number of teeth goes up. So that means the smaller number of teeth means a bigger amount of stress. And so I basically want to look up this value for 16 teeth, which is my smaller gear. And that tells me that the value of Y is going to be 0.296. Out of table 14.2. All right. And when I punch all of these values in, it ends up giving me uh, seven seven thousand nine hundred and eighty two point four PSI. Okay. But again, that's kind of the old way of doing this. I want to show you now what is kind of more actually in practice uh, being used if you need to design gears. And it's based on a uh, fairly long method that is presented in the book uh, using the uh, kind of standards put out by the American Gear Manufacturers Association. So that's the next part of our problem. Where I want to start with this is there is kind of a central equation that is used for these uh, gear tooth bending questions, okay? The central equation is found on page 738. We are using U.S. customary units, and so there's kind of two halves of that equation, one for U.S. customary units and one for SI units. So on page 738, equation 1415, we have that stress is equal to uh, w superscript T times K sub 0 times K sub V times K sub S times, okay, the P that we have here with the subscript of D, uh, that is just the uh, diametral pitch. It says in here when it's describing these variables, it's the transverse diametral pitch. The reason why it has that uh, special sort of indicator on there is that uh, they're trying to make sure that this equation is also applicable for gears that aren't straight cut. So if they're cut at a helix uh, rather than being straight cut, they're basically saying that is what you have for the transverse diametral pitch. Um, and then we have the face width. And then we have K sub M. And we have K sub B. And then we have a factor of j down here. All right. And this is equation 1415. And there's a lot of stuff in there. OK? But you might notice, let me actually kind of highlight a few variables. That one, that one that one, and this is the one that's a little bit weirder. What you actually see as the backbone of this equation is the Lewis equation. You see that? So it's actually not different as far as you know, what its roots are. It's not different uh, because it still has this transverse, uh, excuse me, the tangential uh, component of force. It still has diametral pitch. It still has face width. And now it does have this different factor over here. It is not the Lewis form factor. 
it is what, the, uh, what is designated as the geometry factor, which is kind of a refined version of the Lewis form factor. So it's, it's better. They've uh, accounted for more things now with respect to the geometry of gear teeth, and it's, it's a better thing to use now than the uh, Lewis form factor that used to be used. As far as these other variables, K0, okay, that one it says is the overload factor. KV is the dynamic factor. KS is the size factor, KM is the load distribution factor, and KB is the rim thickness factor. And we are going to have to address each one of those sort of corrections to the basic equation uh, that is kind of inside of here. All right, so toward this end, um, you know, let me actually sort of identify one thing we already have. We just now found this... Um, tangential component of force, and so I already know what that value is. It's 787.6 pounds. So we're really making progress. Anything else that we know here? Okay. So I wrote it the way they have it in the equation. The question that just was asked was, what's the difference between P and P sub D? Um, it's basically just a notation difference. There really isn't a difference for this problem. Um, it is still just the diametral pitch, uh, but in, when we're using it in this AGMA equation, they put that little subscript of D on there. And it does say in the notes down below that it's the transverse diametral pitch. But anyway, for us, it is still just six teeth per inch. All right, what about F? Two inches. So we're actually doing pretty good so far. We already know a bunch of the things that we need to put into this equation. What about the other things? Okay. Um, well, let's actually start with J. All right. Uh, J is a, uh, you know, again, it's the geometry factor. And if you flip over a couple of pages to page 745, you will find a chart there. And we have a decision we have to make with respect to how to use J, okay? The decision we need to make is, do we want to use uh, a value for J that is based on the entire load being applied to the tip of the tooth? Or do we need to use a factor for J that is based more on the actual uh, worst case scenario for when a gear mates, there's a worst case scenario for how high on the tooth a single tooth has to carry load, right? You might remember when we were talking last time, teeth can carry, uh, te teeth can actually share the tangential load when you're transitioning from having just one, you know, as, as gears mate, you might have one, te one tooth that's pushing, and then at some point you get another tooth that starts to share the load, and at some point the first tooth releases it. Well, one, one of the things that the J factor here does is it accounts for that worst case scenario that actually exists when gears mate with each other. Um, and that's why you have a bunch of uh, inputs, kind of variables on this chart on page 745, the, the chart is figure 14.6. You have a bunch of different uh, numbers of teeth listed for this chart so that it can give you these different values of J and account for that fact that the, you might not need to account for that load being all the way out at the tip of the tooth of the gear. But it also, on that same chart, puts in one line that says, use this if the, if the load is applied at the tip of the tooth, okay? The more conservative thing for us to do is to pretend like the entire load is put on the tip of the tooth. But if you want to get something that's more accurate, something that is a, a little bit better estimation of what the real stress might be, then you might want to use um, a, a different curve so that you figure out, you know, what is it for the actual uh, value once you account for the fact that some of the uh, load might be shared between teeth. All right, so what do you want to do? Okay, if you, if you don't have some real good reason why you want to get it super accurate, a lot of times what you've seen us do in here is where we've just decided to be a little bit more conservative. Okay, and that's what I'm going to do here. I won't say that it's wrong to, to go with the one that's more accurate, but I will go ahead and say that if you look on figure 
and uh, it says number of teeth for which geometry factor is desired is along the horizontal axis. We're going to find 16 on there and read up to the curve that says load applied at the tip of the tooth. And when we read up to there, you'll actually see that it uh, com comes out to be 0.225 or so. Okay. So this is equal to 0.225 based on uh, figure 14.6. Okay, uh, load at the tip. Okay, what if I wanted to not you put the load at the tip and instead figure it out for the actual scenario? Well, what you see there is you can keep reading up a little bit higher uh, until we reach, it looks to me like the curve intersects at about uh, 0.27 or so. Okay. Okay, so the, the reason for the discrepancy, again, between those two values is, do you assume the load is applied right at the tip, which is kind of your worst case scenario you could have, or do you assume that as the gears that we've identified are mating with each other, um, that, you know, as they mate with each other, that you actually get that load sharing between teeth and uh, you don't necessarily have to have one tooth carrying the load all the way at the tip. All right, so that was the geometry factor. So I'm going to go ahead and label that right here, geometry factor. And it takes the place of the Lewis form factor uh, relative to the last equation that we used. All right, so after this one, let's actually go on and uh, try to decide which one we want to do next here. Which one do you want to do next? Okay, let's start at the left, okay. So uh, K sub O there um, is the overload factor. Okay. And so if we have an overload factor there, what do you think the value might be for the overload factor? Okay. Someone says one. Why would you say one? Okay, this information right here, we're saying that we're transmitting a uniform power of five horsepower, right? So that word right there is an indicator to you that there aren't spikes, right? There aren't torque spikes is really kind of what we're talking about. Um, there are, actually, if you go to this section where they talk about the overload factor, uh, more or less what the section says is that you can really only know what these are after you are familiar with the machine that you are trying to design that's using gears. And based on that machine, you know, the example, I think, I think they give an example in here for like an internal combustion engine. You have very, very large spikes for the amount of torque that you might have, uh, especially as the number of pistons in your engine goes lower and lower. You actually end up getting larger and larger spikes for those instantaneously largest amounts but it doesn't really give you a lot of, of guidance as, as to how to know what that overload factor should be. It's kind of one of those things that says, for your industry, the machine that you're designing, you might have an idea of what that maximum load would be relative to the, um, relative to the sort of the steady load. So anyway, for us, since we're uniform, we just say this is equal to one. Okay. So the overload factor is equal to one. Excellent, that made that easy. So now what, KV? All right, KV, we're gonna need to do a little more calculation for KV. So I'm gonna put that down here as the velocity factor. <clears throat> or dynamic factor, I guess is what they call it. Okay. So here's the thing, whenever you have gears that are running together, the faster they go uh, makes it to where any little discrepancy in how they are built leads to sort of some shock loading, right? If you get a, a tooth that is not made exactly right, then every time it contacts the tooth that it's mating with, it's, there's going to be an instantaneous like jolt of force once it hits 
uh, at that point. And so it's really, really important if you're going to run things really fast, it's really important in order to get the, uh, you know, it's really important to make those teeth as accurately as possible or else you'll start incurring more stress just from the fact that you're running them together quickly and they may not be made perfectly. Okay, and so we have factors that account for this. So if you will, kind of flip over to uh, page 748. 748, kind of the basic equation is 1427. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a second. Into that equation, we're going to insert two factors that they call A and B. All right. And in order to calculate A, you need B. So we're going to start with B. Okay, B is actually given in equation 1428. What are these factors? These are just factors that you plug into this other equation. They don't necessarily have a lot of meaning uh, intrinsically. So we're going to basically say that we have this factor of B that is given with 0.25 times 12 minus QV. All of this taken to the two-thirds. So now we need to say, what is QV? Okay. This is basically a quality number. All right. It is a number that encapsulates how well were these teeth made. And uh, fortunately for us, we were given right here that this is going to be made with number six quality standards. So what do you think we use for QV? Six. <clears throat> okay, that's B, and if you punch those in and, uh, and solve, uh, let me see here, that ends up giving us 0.8255. Well, then we can plug that into the next one to solve for A. All right, A, the, the function there is 50 plus... 56 times 1 minus B. Okay, and we plug in the factor of B there into that location, and this ends up giving us, <clears throat> let's see now, 59.77. All right, and so then that gets us, you know, these two equations, by the way, these are equation uh, 1428. We take uh, the result of that and plug it into equation uh, 1427, and that gives us that KV is equal to uh, 59.77. Uh, plus the square root of V is what it has in there. And V uh, is the pitch line velocity. And it tells you to put in your pitch line velocity in units of feet per minute. Okay? So that's actually exactly what we have. Uh, our pitch line velocity was down here, 209.5 feet per minute. Okay, and then this gets divided by the factor of A again. The factor of A was 59.77, and then this whole thing is going to be raised to the exponent of B. All right, so based on our quality number of six and our pitch line velocity, we end up with a number here for K sub V uh, equal to 1.196. All right, so now we have that number in there, 1.196.
that up here. All right, K sub S. Let's look at this one. K sub S is the size factor. Okay, so let's flip over and they have a little section about the size factor. Um, and I, I haven't actually spent time and gone to the most current AGMA standards to see if there's an update to this, but based on this textbook, it basically says that this is an optional factor. Okay, it says that right now it's okay if you always want to just set this equal to one, uh, but it also gives you an equation there where you can figure out what K sub S should be based on a Lewis form factor, a face width, and a diametral pitch. So let me do this. I'm actually, I am going to set this equal to one. If I didn't want to set it equal to one, it's easy enough just to punch in the numbers into the equation that they give you there and get a K sub S value. What may be more important is to talk about what this is supposed to be doing, okay? So the type of stress that will typically make gear teeth fail is fatigue because they get a repeated load, right? As you run the, the uh, gear, the tooth will come up and it will be loaded for a moment and then it'll be unloaded, right? And then it'll come back around and be loaded again and then unloaded. So they get a very fatigue type of load that's being applied. And if you think about the, the way that they are loaded, um, if you go back to chapter six and remember when we uh, used our fatigue equations, um, one of the things that we had to do is that if we had any other case besides rotating bending, we had a case of B size factor remember back then when we were doing that? And what that accounted for was the fact that um, a different amount of material may be experiencing the peak stresses. And we accounted for that with this thing that, that we used that was called the size factor. That is what this factor is doing. Um, and if you want to use it, you can use the equation there. It's on page five, 751. But for right now, I'm going to make the decision to say, we'll just let it be equal to 1. It says you can in the standard, so we're going to go ahead and just let it equal to 1. That makes sense, but that's what it was there to try to account for. All right, so let's move on. Uh, the next uh, factor that we need to look for is K sub M. K sub M, it lists it in here as the load distribution factor. So here's the thing. Whenever you set up gears to mate with each other, you can never get them 100% perfect as far as the alignment of the two axes of the shafts that they rotate on, okay? So when you line them up, it could be that your bearings are off just, you know, ever so slightly, and it makes it to where you do not have uniform bearing stress between the teeth of the gear. So you can kind of imagine here, the, the longer the face width, if you let that gear get really, really, really wide, it becomes harder and harder and harder to actually align it and get it to where your load is distributed all the way across that entire face width. Does that make sense? So what you're doing with this K sub M factor is you're trying to account for that and say, you know, based on our knowledge of how, how closely we can get things aligned, let's make an estimate and figure out, you know, what this um, kind of worst case scenario could be for stress, uh, given the fact that we're not going to be able to align it perfectly. Okay. So, Load distribution factor. Okay. If we go back and we flip to page 751 again, and it's on the bo very bottom of the page, the basic equation is K sub M is equal to 1 plus a parameter they call C sub MC times another factor in here is C sub PF, C sub PM plus C sub MA times C sub E. And if you didn't have anything more, you'd feel really sad right now because there's a lot of variables that we have to try to figure out. Fortunately, on the following page, page 752, it helps you with all of these things. By the way, this was equation, the, f the very first one there was equation 1430. 
Okay? But fortunately, we have all this help here. Okay? So the first thing it says is C sub MC. That's answering the question of whether we have crowned teeth or uncrowned teeth. Okay? And I don't think they're talking about like a grill. All right? We're talking about, um, let me see here. Uncrowned, it says, we're using, we're using uncrowned for both sides, all right? Here's what they're talking about there. When you cut gear teeth, you can cut them so that the, basically the, the uh, contact surface just goes straight across the whole thing. All of the teeth are straight. The other thing you can do is you can cause the middle portion of the gear to actually be a little bit higher than the outside edges of the gear. Right, and that's called crowning the teeth. So uh, you can kind of think in your mind, why does that make a difference? Well, if you end up off, if you end up with just a little bit of misalignment, then if you have crowned teeth, that helps you out a little bit because it helps transmit the load still always more to the center rather than having to have it all on one edge if you end up misaligned a little bit. Okay, so since we have uncrowned teeth though for our gears, which, you know, uncrowned teeth are typically cheaper. That's why you might want to get uncrowned teeth. Crowned teeth are more expensive. Um, so we go here to uh, equation 1431. It says for uncrowned teeth, use one. Okay? So we use one right here. Okay, so that's C sub MC. The next thing is C sub PF, all right? And for this, it basically gives you a few different ranges of face width, all right? And says if you have a face width of less than one, you should be in, a first, in the first uh, equation within that uh, piecewise equation. But if you have a face width that's between one and 17 inches, then you're in the second, okay? So that's where we are. So C sub PF, now is going to just be equal to the face width of two inches over 10, okay? Lowercase d sub p, what is that? Okay, you might, I don't know if you remember this from earlier, but that is your pitch diameter, okay? So we're gonna look for this, for the, uh, you know, the smaller of the two gears here, what is that um, pitch diameter? And it is just, you might remember, we said it a few minutes ago, 2.667 inches. <clears throat> okay, this is the diameter of the pinion. Okay, it's just the pitch diameter uh, of the pinion. Okay, but then we need to subtract from that 0 0.0375 and add to it 0 0.0125 <clears throat> times the face width. Okay, and I, you know, one of the reasons I, you know, I, I don't mind doing these problems. They kind of bother me sometimes, though, because one of the things you'll notice in that equation is that um, it is not dimensionally consistent, right? Uh, I assume there was some sort of a factor of units in one of these coefficients that, that made it work, but either way, um, they are expecting you to use values in inches in there and then it'll give you the, the uh, number that you're supposed to get out of it. And so when I put this in, um, it ends up giving me 0 0.0625. Okay, so that goes in right here. Okay, C sub PM. Okay, it says 
you use one for a straddle mounted pinion or on onto equation 1433. It says we're supposed to use one for a straddle mounted pinion uh, such that S1 over S. So that actually refers to a figure down below, figure 1410. Uh, it's trying to say how far off center is your gear, right? So if it's straddle mounted means it's basically simply supported at its ends with a gear in between. And then the second part is saying, are you right in the middle or are you off center significantly, okay? So what we're doing though for ours is that we're just center mounting them. I believe that was a piece of information I gave at the beginning. Uh, evenly spaced between bearings. So that tells us here that we are um, in, a, in a position where S1 over S is zero, right? So we are less than 0.175, and that allows us to use a C sub PM of equal to one. All right, so I put that in for C sub PM. The next one, C sub MA, okay? This is just um, a, another factor that we put in here. This one happens to be according to a parabolic fit with a few parameters in it. So C sub uh, MA is equal to A. All right, and then it gives you for uh, the values of A, B, and C in this parabolic fit, uh, it gives you a few different options for the condition of how the gears are going to be aligned. The options here are open gearing or commercial enclosed gearing or precision enclosed gearing or for extra precision enclosed gearing. Okay, what do we have? Okay, we're, we're talking about a commercial enclosed unit. And so this allows us to get uh, A to be 0.127. Okay, uh, B is 0.158. Okay, and this is added. That is multiplied by the face width. And I'm going to drop units because this is an empirical equation and it's expecting inches uh, as the input unit. And then for C, we have negative 0.930 times 10 to the minus fourth and that times 2 squared. Okay, so... The equation I just wrote there is 1434. Okay, where the coefficients here that are in the equation, okay, these coefficients right here come from table 14.9. Uh, and the result uh, that comes out of there is 0 0.158. All right, so I put that in here. And then Lastly, we have C sub E. It says, uh, this is equation 1435. It says use 0.8 if you have gearing adjusted at assembly or the compatibility is improved by lapping or both or one for all other conditions. Okay, let me kind of just talk about that a little bit. Um, this refers to just how much care was taken to assemble the unit, right? So if you have some sort of adjustment available, or you can assure that your axes of your shafts end up being more correct than if you just sort of install them uh, otherwise, right? Then you can actually give yourself a little bit of an advantage with this factor. The other thing that is mentioned in here is the idea of lapping. Have you ever heard of lapping? So whenever you get two different machine parts that are going to be running together, but they haven't ever run together before, 
one of the things that you can do is set them up to go ahead and run together, but then put in a very, very uh, fine uh, abrasive compound in between the pieces that are going to run together on, on purpose. You go in and you put in some sort of a little abrasive compound in between them and you run it for a while and then you clean out that abrasive compound. What that does is it actually takes off little bits of material on the two parts that have to mate with one another and it makes, it, it makes the surfaces that are supposed to be smooth and that work well with the other part, it ends up making them really do that. Whereas, you know, straight out of whatever the previous process was that made those parts, they may have had things, they may have had surfaces that weren't quite smooth, that didn't work well with the other surface, and so you can actually end up making two parts that have to work together, work together a little bit more by doing this initial phase where you put in a little bit of abrasive compound and run them together. And then you clean that out and then you put it into actual service. So anyway, if we do that, we can give ourselves a little bit of an advantage with respect to the alignment of our gears, or we don't, right? And so uh, we, are, we didn't say anything in here about special adjustment or lapping or anything like that. So we, we can't use an advantage there. And so we go ahead and put in a factor of one for C sub E. Okay. And so now plugging in all of those values that we just found, it causes this to become, let's see, 1.22. So we plug that in up here for K sub M. <clears throat> K sub M, again, was the load distribution factor. What was the question? Was it K sub B Bergstrasser? Uh, no. Someone said K sub B is that Bergstrasser factor. No, nope. Bergstrasser factor is for springs. And so we're kind of out of that world now. <clears throat> All right, K sub B is something that's called a rim thickness factor. Okay, so here's what the rim thickness factor is designed to try to do. Um, let's say that you have a, a real gear that's in service. A lot of times what they do with real gears is that, you know, I guess we have two different options. Let's say that these are two different sections through the middle of a gear, right? So here's one section, and so this would go on a shaft or whatever. Sometimes what you may have seen with gears, especially the bigger and bigger they go, you may have seen that instead of them being shaped like that all the way through, they have a more slender part at the middle, something like this. So again, I'm doing a section right through the middle of the gear with my little drawing here. Have you ever seen a gear where the section that goes through the middle of the gear might look something like this? So you're basically, um, you know, what this would look like in 3D, it would look something like this, right? Where it has like a hub in the middle and then it comes out and then there might be another hub on the outside, but then there's this kind of a dip on the middle before it comes back out to the outside. That's not a great picture either, but uh, I wish I had one to, that I had a picture of that I could just show you. But the idea is that you can actually uh, reduce some of the material in the gear by making the, this web in the middle of it thinner, okay? Well, when you do that, what ends up happening is that there's a rim that exists out here, and if that rim is too thin, then you're not giving the tooth enough support from behind or you know, as that rim gets thinner and thinner, it can end up you know, having less support for the, the uh, bending of the tooth. And so K sub B is a factor that allows you to uh, kind of uh, account for that in some way. Page 756 discusses this uh, case, and what you'll notice there is that they have this factor that's called a backup ratio, and uh, if this backup ratio, which is the thickness of the rim, that's actually what this is right here, T sub R, divided by uh, H sub T, which is the tooth height, right? So 
I should really say that's the rip thickness of the rim and then imagine there's a tooth on top of that, All right? And that's the height of the tooth, T uh, or H sub T, that's what they're calling that. So if your tooth height is a lot taller than your rim height, then you may end up needing to uh, account for some sort of a weakness in the rim that goes around the outside. The uh, threshold value for this ratio is 1.2. For our problem, it doesn't really matter either anyway, because I basically said right at the very beginning, we are using plain gear blanks, okay? Plain gear blanks are ones more like the first picture that I drew, where they are a uniform thickness um, throughout the entire blank of the gear. So we have no rim, and so we don't need to have a rim thickness factor, okay? Or we, you know, by saying that, I just mean we set it equal to one. Okay? All right. And that accounts for all of the factors that go into the AGMA equation. Okay? So when we plug all of those in, I guess I'll kind of say we'll take this down here and we'll calculate a stress that comes out of here. The stress that we get ends up being uh, 15,323 PSI. And this is the AGMA bending stress. Okay, well, so what? We actually don't know yet um, how much stress we should be able to carry. So that's the other part of the question. Now that we know the AGMA bending stress, we need to know some kind of a strength that we can compare the stress value to so that we can know what a factor of safety might be, okay? So where we need to go for that is over to Let's see. If you look on page 741, <clears throat> okay, what you see there is an allowable bending strength. And this is your allowable uh, stress that basically you can have. If you're using US customary units, it says that your allowable stress is equal to S sub T over S sub F times Y sub N over K sub T times K sub R. which is a whole bunch more variables, okay? Um, what I will go ahead and start with is to say that S sub F is your factor of safety. And that's actually what we were tasked with finding, okay? What do you do with this whole thing? Like what, if you find an allowable stress what can you set it equal to? Your actual stress, right? So you, you, when you set your allowable stress equal to your actual stress, that can allow you to find a factor of safety. All right, so I'll just go ahead and make that note over here. We're going to uh, set equal to the bending stress we just found. So this comes down here and it's going to be plugged in right there. Okay, um, S sub T, all right? S sub T is more of a material property. It is the actual allowable bending stress in the material itself. But we have other factors here that account for things like fatigue and uh, reliability and those kinds of things. So 
That's what's different about this allowable bending stress is that, uh, you know, between that and, and the value we have up here, this S sub T we have is the actual allowable stress in the material without all the other factors. So I'll just say allowable material stress. Okay, Y sub N is the stress cycle factor for bending stress. This is where we account for uh, the issue of fatigue. Okay, uh, so I'll put that in here. This is your stress cycle factor. Okay, uh, and that is specifically for bending stress. And then in the denominator, we have K sub T, which accounts for temperature. So if you have elevated temperatures, it can make t you know, materials weaker. And so we have that in here as well. So K sub T is the temperature factor. And then lastly, I mentioned this one, but this is the reliability factor. And so now that we have up here, we've defined uh, what each of the terms mean in that equation for ag agma bending strength. What we're going to do is we're going to go through and try to find the values of each of those uh, terms in there. So um, I guess we'll just start up along the top uh, of this uh, with our allowable uh, material strength. All right. That's uh, let's see. What do they actually call it in here? They call it. Uh, this is based in, so this is, uh, I'm going to say, allowable bending stress number. Okay, that is my S sub T up there. Where we can get this number is from page 739. There's a figure there, figure 14.2. Okay, and uh, you can read off of that figure if you want to um, and, and determine what the allowable bending strength is, but it does actually give you an equation of the curve that we're dealing with um, as long as you know the grade of material that you are using for your gears. And so if you look at that, uh, if you look at that chart, one of the curves is for grade one. If we go up here, we notice that both of our gears are grade one. And keep in mind, we're, we're really only dealing with the pinion uh, because the pinion ha represents a worse scenario in terms of bending strength, uh, and stress and strength. So, uh, but anyway, that's, it, it wouldn't matter because they're both made out of the same material. But if you have two different kinds of material, you would want to make sure you were using the kind of material for the gear that you're actually analyzing. And the equation for that is S sub T equals... Uh, 77.3 times your Brunel hardness number plus 12,800 PSI. Okay, so what's our Brunel hardness number? We go up here, and I believe we said right here that it was 200. Okay, so if that's our through hardened value uh, for Brunel hardness, then what this becomes is 77.3 times 200 uh, plus 12,800. And I'll tell you what, to make this kind of uh, work together, I'll put the PSI to the outside. Remember, these are a lot of these are empirical equations, and the units, you just sort of have to deal with them uh, however you however you have to, to get out the, the type of unit that you need out of the other side. So S sub T ends up becoming, uh, if we punch these in, 28,260 PSI. All right. 
and that's what we put in for S sub T in our uh, bending, allowable bending strength uh, that we're going to get for this AGMA method. All right, so then what? Let's actually go next to what's called the stress cycle factor. And I mentioned uh, before that the stress cycle factor, uh, essentially what it accounts for is the effect of fatigue. Remember, these are not, the tooth of a gear is not a statically loaded piece. It has to be, uh, it has to carry a load that's, which is then taken off and then carried again and then it's taken off. And so uh, what we need to do is flip over to where they have uh, this factor it's written about. Let's see. <clears throat> If we go all the way to page 754 is where that section begins, okay, stress cycle factor, okay, and uh, you'll see there, they have a figure, figure uh, 14, 14, okay, repeatedly applied bending strength cycle factor Y sub N. Okay, and uh, so for this, in order for us to figure out what this cycle factor is, the first thing we need to figure out is how many cycles do we need it to last? Okay, so we go up here and uh, believe that was a piece of information that was given at the very beginning. Uh, life, 10 to the 8th cycles. Okay, so we need this thing to last 10 to the 8th cycles. How many, so how many cycles does a tooth get per revolution? One, right? It gets one stress cycle per revolution, assuming that it's just running in one direction. It gets one stress cycle per revolution. And so um, the number of revolutions is the number of stress cycles. I just figured I'd make mention of that real quick. Um, the next thing we need to do is on this figure, it actually gives us two different curves. Uh, that gives us this Y sub N value, okay? What we're coming up with here is a bending strength. So which of the two curves that they put on here looks like it would make this value more conservative? Because that's typically what I'm going to kind of move you toward, as you've probably noticed through, through this course. We typically will choose something that's more conservative unless what we're trying to do is get a really accurate idea of what it really is. Okay, so if we're going to try to pick the curve at 10 to the 8th cycles that is more conservative, do we want the curve that predicts a lower Y sub N or a higher Y sub N? Probably a lower one because by pick predicting a lower one, it, it gives us a lower amount of strength that we're going to expect is okay. And that's going to lead to a lower uh, factor of safety, okay, which that, that's kind of a more conservative thing. So... Given that, I'm going to pick the lower curve, and the lower curve's uh, equation is 1.6831 times the number of cycles Okay, that number of cycles taken to the negative 0.03. Uh, two, three. Okay, and I'll just put the note down here. That's our conservative estimate for uh, this value. All right, and this calculates to be 0.928. Okay, one quick comment that I will, uh, that I will make here. Uh, you might notice this big inflection point on that chart that looks like it happens at around, uh, you know, partway between 10 to the 6th and 10 to the 7th cycles. Okay. Um, if you read in the little, in the little section over here, um, it basically tells you why this is. The strength values are essentially centered around that inflection point right there, okay? 
and uh, you know I don't remember off the top of my head, so I'm reading here real quick. It looks like they made that to be 10 to the seventh, right? All of these standards are written for 10 to the seventh number of cycles, at which point this value will be one. If you need more cycles than that, the value goes less than one. If you need fewer cycles than that, the value goes to uh, higher than one. So that's um, just a little note along the way as to this value. Since we need 10 to the eighth, it ends up being a little bit less than one. All right, so there's that. Uh, the next one we might want to do is the reliability factor right here. Okay. For the reliability factor, uh, I don't necessarily need to even compute anything in particular for that because uh, it allows you in section 1414, page 756 in table 1410, this case of R can just be looked up out of a table if you have a kind of a commonly used number. Interesting thing to note for this reliability factor is that the default number is based on 99% reliability, for at least for this context, okay? So the default number is for 99% uh, reliability. That gives you k sub r of equal to one. We don't need quite that much reliability because it said at the very beginning of this problem that we were going to try to design this for 90% reliability. And what table 1410 allows you to do is to back off of that, um, well, it, what it'll actually end up doing is increase the amount of strength that we predict here. And it does so by putting a 0.85 right here. So again, if we needed more than 99% reliability, we would have a value of more than one there, but we need less than 99%, so it gives us a value less than one. At 50% reliability, that term ends up being 0.7. Okay, so that is based again, table uh, 1410. <clears throat> All right, for temperature factor, uh, that is a factor that really only comes into play when you have really, really elevated temperatures. All right, we typically don't start trying to worry about the temperature too much. Actually, it says right here, um, up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 120 degrees Celsius, just use K sub T equal to one, okay? So this temperature factor winds up being one this is based on section 1415. On page 756. Okay. <coughs> and our temperature is less than, uh, with presumably anyway, less than uh, 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Which you can presume that. If you're given like homework problems and whatnot, you can presume that unless you're given some kind of data about temperature that makes you believe that you should be dealing with an elevated temperature. All right, so let me look at this now. We are gonna plug in the stress that we got from the bending stress in for the allowable stress here. We found an allowable material stress number. We found a reliability factor and a temperature factor and a stress cycle factor. That means we should be able to solve for our factor of safety uh, using this AGMA method. So let me do that. Okay, we'll say 15, uh, 323 PSI is going to be equal to that allowable stress number that we found down here, 28,260 PSI. Over this factor of safety times my stress cycle factor number. So that is 0.928 over my temperature factor, which was just one, and my reliability factor, which is 0.85. And when we solve this for my factor of safety, <coughs> what it ends up giving me is a value of 2.01. Okay, and one thing I'll note as we've gotten to this point for this factor of 
the relationship between force applied and stress experienced is linear for all of these calculations that we just did. Since that relationship is linear, uh, what does this number essentially mean? It means we should be able to apply about double the amount of torque that we are and we'd still be okay. All right? That's basically what that number means, at least with respect to tooth bending. We'd still be okay. All right, so that's kind of the end of the question of tooth bending. We've now got a factor of safety. And what we need to do now is go back up and remember what else did we need to solve for this problem. Okay, so the next item in the list is the agma contact stress and factor of safety. Okay, so this is a whole other factor that comes into play when we are dealing with gears. We don't only have to deal with the uh, bending of a tooth. We also need to deal with the fact that there are actually contact, there's actually contact that occurs between the, uh, the gear teeth. And just to kind of get us going on this and remind us of, of how this works, you may remember from when we covered this in advanced strengths, um, when we had contact stresses between two parts that contacted each other, we actually saw that there was a kind of a worst place where stress occurred, and it's going to be in this zone that's actually barely below the surface of the material. We also saw that it has a nonlinear relationship between the amount of force applied right, and the amount of stress that's experienced. And the reason for that is that the uh, amount of area actually starts to change as you begin to push these pieces together. The contact patch grows the harder you push. And so as it grows, it, it allows more material to carry that load. And so it ends up with this nonlinear relationship for stress. And you also might remember that we talked about the typical um, appearance of a part that has now failed in contact fatigue is that it will start to look pitted. Why do you think the surface may start to look pitted? Okay, let's say you have a surface here that has been experiencing these contact stresses. The worst case stress is occurring barely below the surface right here, and there is no uh, characteristic that is kind of an endurance limit, so it doesn't really matter how lightly you push. At some point, it will uh, cause it to fail. Well, it, and it fails kind of in a compressive mode. It, it's got these high compressive stresses down there, which, which lead to actually high shearing stresses between there and the sides of this little kind of, uh, you know, it becomes a pit, right? At some point, after there's been enough surface fatigue, that little chunk of material gets ejected. And what you will see is you'll see on the surface of your part this little hole. Right? It'll kind of be this little pit like this. Okay? And if you look at, uh, there, there's a number of different things you could look at. You can actually see this in ball bearings a lot of times, or feel it is another way that you may have seen this. Has anyone ever had something that utilizes a ball bearing? And then after running that ball bearing for a long time, the ball bearing starts to feel uh, crunchy. Okay, yeah. So what happens there uh, is that that ball bearing, as it carries those repeated cycles, it gets that contact fatigue, and uh, you know it gets worse if you have contaminants in there, like if you get dirt or something in there. But my point here is that you don't even have to have any contaminants in the contact between the surfaces. It can actually fatigue and cause pitting of the surfaces between the balls and the races. Uh, or in our case, between the teeth of our mating gears, after a while, if there's enough surface fatigue, little chunks of material get, sh get thrown out and you start feeling this uh, kind of crunchiness, okay? Um, I will say this, most gears are made to run in a lubricant of some kind. And we saw whenever we studied uh, journal bearings that when you have a lubricant between two parts and there is a relative velocity between the parts, that relative velocity generates a little film, and that film does a lot to help you know, uh, reduce the amount of contact fatigue that will happen in these bearings. But what's tricky about gears is that as the gears mate with each other, 
there is actually a reversal of direction of, of relative velocity between the teeth. So you think about this, teeth come in and there's a sliding that happens between teeth as they begin to contact and then at some point they reverse direction and they start coming back away. And since there's a reversal of direction, it means there is a point where there's zero velocity. All right? And where that zero velocity point happens, the fluid film of your lubricant tends to break down and it doesn't support any load anymore. And what you will see on gears that have begun to fail in this uh, contact fatigue type of a uh, scenario is that there will be actually a line of pits on the gear tooth right at a particular location. And that line of pits on the gear tooth actually happens right there at that location where the two gears where they're mating, they come to zero velocity. It creates this little line of pits right on the gear tooth. So that's, you know, I, I feel like it's good to kind of know what the practical look is of something that fails in this, um, in this scenario. You might also remember, I'll, I'll kind of go back and say, uh, we studied uh, this contact fatigue uh, back again in, in, in uh, advanced strengths, and you may remember this equation that said this contact stress is going to be equal to an elastic coefficient C sub P multiplied by a square root of the amount of force carried divided by the width, okay, that would be kind of uh, analogous to our face width that we have for our gear teeth. It's how wide is that contact, uh, which we assume is going to be a um, cylindrical contact if the gears are not crowned, okay? Um, multiplied by one over R1 plus one over R2, where R1 and R2 are the radius of curvature values at the two locations of the parts that are mating with each other. So for the little picture that I drew up here, you would basically have, you know, R1 and R2 for the radius curvature values for these two parts that are touching each other, okay? Well, one of the reasons I wanna bring that up is what, what I'm gonna do now is show you what the AGMA equation is for uh, contact stress and show you that it's, it's really not different. Its roots are in this same concept. It's just got a lot of other stuff around it as well. So the AGMA equation for contact stress, okay, is given by, and if you want to find this, this is Let's see, back a few pages from where I am. Let's see. On page 738, again, there's two different forms of the equation. One, if you're dealing with US customary units and the other, if you are dealing with SI units. Functionally, there isn't much difference between them, um, but they do have different letters that they use for them. So. The form of it that we're using since we're in the U.S. customary system is that we first start with my um, elastic coefficient there, okay, multiplied by a big old square root. One of the terms in there is the W superscript T. It then has uh, K sub O, which uh, is the same as we had before. It's an overload factor. Then we have a K sub V, which is again the same as we had before whenever we looked at bending stress in the teeth. So it's a uh, dynamic factor. Then we have a K sub S, okay, which is a place where we can account for a size effect for the fatigue in the uh, parts if that's something that we wanna do. Uh, then we have K sub M, which you might remember that was the load distribution factor. And this divided by uh, again, D sub P, that is the uh, pitch diameter for the, um, for the gear that we are going to be analyzing. Then we have F, which is the face width. And then we have a C sub F factor, okay? The C sub F factor that we have there is called a surface condition factor. So this is, uh, you know, if, you're, if your condition of your surface isn't very good, 
then you may not get the amount of load distribution that you expect out of the equations, and so there's a factor there to correct for that. And then the last thing we have is um, I, and I is again a geometry factor, but it's called a geometry factor for pitting resistance, okay? So these are all of the variables that go into this equation. So here's what I want to show you is that uh, we basically have the roots of this equation are uh, in the original equation that we had for uh, this contact stress, okay? So the WT, that kind of corresponds with the F that we had up here. Um, the W, that actually corresponds with the F that I have right there because that's the width of contact. Uh, kind of that line of contact between the two parts that are contacting, okay? Um, and then all of the stuff that we have over here, like all of this stuff, actually all of that stuff and more is actually encapsulated into uh, the I that is right here because the other factor that, that is sort of built into I is the idea that... Uh, W, T, and F are, are definitely related to each other, but there's also a factor of the angle of contact that happens due to the uh, pressure line that the force is applied along. And so that is actually also built into that I factor to take care of that uh, line of action, okay? Um, and then, of course, uh, we also have the C sub P that's over here, just like we have right here. So those are the same exact value. All the other factors that go into here, um, you know, with the exception, I guess, of the pitch diameter, the pitch diameter works together with the geometry factor. Uh, so that kind of, I guess, put those two together in order to get all these other factors that are related to the geometry. All the other factors, the Ks and then the C, those are basically just correction factors that we apply to uh, be able to do good design for gears. Okay, so where would you like to start to find our uh, AGMA contact stress? Just, yeah, we can just start at the left if you want to. Okay, so on the left end, C sub P. All right, C sub P, again, uh, this thing is called the elastic coefficient. Okay, and the elastic coefficient, um, we have a formula for that, actually. The, uh, the formula for it is the same as we used before when we were, we were dealing with, um, you know, our contact stresses. Uh, that formula, uh, I believe it's given in here. To look it up real quick. Let's see here. <clears throat> there it is. It is going to be one over okay, um, pi times uh, one minus Poisson's ratio for the pinion over the elastic and that, that squared over the uh, modulus of elasticity for the pinion, okay, plus. Uh, 1 minus Poisson's ratio for the gear squared uh, all over the modulus of elasticity for the gear. And then uh, all of that is what's multiplied by pi. This entire factor is taken to the 1 half power, in other words, the square root. Okay. Well, the reason this is called the elastic coefficient uh, is that with the elastic coefficient, all of the variables that are plugged into it are just elastic properties of the materials, okay? So if you know, for instance, that we have steel on steel contact, well, these elastic coefficients don't vary a whole lot for steels, and so you end up with a fairly constant value if you know you have steel on steel contact, okay? Um, or you can plug in the values. So for us, with our uh, values that we have for steel, uh, 
we would have 1 over uh, pi times 1 minus uh, the Poisson's ratio that we have for steel is 0.292. That's from the table in the back of the book. Okay, that is squared all over the 30 times 10 to the uh, 6 PSI. Okay, and then this gets, since we have steel for both the pinion and the gear, then we can basically just say this times 2. Right, and multiplied by pi, all of this taken to the one half power. And when you punch this in, it ends up giving you a value for C sub P of 2284.7. Now let's think about the units for this. Okay. I have PSI in the denominator of the denominator, so that kind of moves it back to the numerator, right? And then I take that to the one-half power, okay? That may feel like that might, you know, it feels a little bit wrong to a lot of people whenever we do that. This is not incorrect. That is the unit that we have for our elastic coefficient, okay? Square root of stress. Uh, one of the reasons for this has to do with that variable area that happens as you begin to apply load. Okay. All right, so there's C sub P. We have a value for it. Um, let me also show you this. There is another table that's in the book, uh, table 14.8, where it uh, lists out a few of these elastic uh, coefficients. And uh, you'll notice there that it has a steel on steel value that's listed. And it gives it to you in uh, pounds per square inch, right? Or actually, I guess, square root of that. And it gives it to you as 2300. Okay? So, or use table 14.8. Uh, So it gives you an idea of where they get these numbers out of that table. Um, which one should you use? Well, let me say, um, if you have the information about the elastic constants, I would use the equation, all right, rather than just looking it up out of the table, unless you are given expl explicit uh, directions to use the table. All right, so that's what we have right there. 2284.7 square root of PSI. All right. What should we do next? Okay. Let's recall that we actually have some of these other values already. The WT value uh, doesn't change from what we had already computed uh, earlier, and so that ends up giving us 787.6 pounds. Okay. The uh, overload factor, remember we are transmitting uniform uh, torque profile through these gears, and if, you're, if it's uniform, you can put in a value of 1 for our overload factor. KV also does not change relative to the bending stress question. Um, and so we can just remember what we used for KV, 1.196 for KV, okay. KS, okay, that, by the way, KV, that's the dynamic factor, that's what it's named. KS is a size factor, and we discussed that a little bit when we did the bending question. And uh, we basically said that the book allows you to use one. In other words, the, at the time the book was written, the AGMA standard said you could use one. If you don't want to use one and you want to use the equation they put there in the book instead to get a size factor, uh, you can also do that. So we'll go ahead and just uh, plug in the value of one there uh, 
for uh, the contact stress. All right, what about D sub P? That's the pitch diameter. And uh, again, we've already computed that once. Uh, the way you compute that, if you need to compute it, is you have the number of teeth, 16 teeth, you divide by the uh, diametral pitch, and that gives you the pitch diameter. And that ends up being 2.667 inches. Okay. What about face width? Okay, two inch face width. Okay, what about KM? Okay, that was 1.22. This was the load distribution factor, you may remember. So we've got that plugged in right there. Now, CF. Okay, CF is a surface condition factor. Okay, and uh, so let's flip and look at that section for just a moment. Uh, section 14.9. Okay. What it's basically saying here is that if you have information to indicate that the surface of your gears has deteriorated some, then one of the ways you can deal with that is by uh, putting on a factor right here. Okay? And so what I'll say is we don't have any detrimental surface conditions that are given to us for this problem, and so therefore we're going to let CF be equal to 1. Okay, this is on page uh, 750, is where that CF factor is discussed. No detrimental surface conditions. Known. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we are left with just one factor that we have to come up with, and that factor is this geometry factor for pitting resistance, okay? That's this uh, I value. So geometry factor for pitting resistance. Okay, where we go for that is uh, to section 14.5, let's back a couple pages, all right, and it goes through some of the, the, uh, you know, the development of this, and you see very clearly in there that it's basically depends, this, this value depends on um, the uh, kind of those radius values that I mentioned before, as well as the pressure angle, angle value. And it encapsulates it nicely here into an equation that's appropriate for external gears, as well as another part of it that's appropriate for internal gears. Do we have external gears or internal gears here? Okay, these are external gears because the teeth point outward, right? They point outward and they mesh with each other. You can also have a type of gear that points inward. We saw that with a ring gear, and then the gear me meshes with it that way. So we're dealing with here with an external gear, so we're going to deal with uh, the top part of that equation. Okay, And it gives it to you as I is equal to uh, cosine of phi sub t uh, sine of phi sub t. Okay, over 2 times m sub n multiplied by mg over mg plus 1. Okay, so let's discuss some of those variables. This, by the way, is equation 1423. On page 747. Okay, 
So the first thing I want to say is that phi sub t is the transverse pressure angle for these gears. Uh, the reason that it has that term transverse in there is they wanted this equation to be robust enough to handle gears that are cut with helically cut teeth, like helically shaped teeth, so helical gears that mate with each other. Um, when that happens, the effective pressure angle changes, right? And you have to pick off just a tangential component, um, or excuse me, a transverse component of that angle. When you're dealing with spur gears, the, the uh, transverse pressure angle is the same uh, as the just normal pressure angle that you would have for those gears, okay? So for spur gears, I'll put down below here, okay? When you see spur gears, you can interpret that as being straight cut gears, okay? So what is that for us? 20 degrees. Okay. Now what about M sub N? Okay. Uh, M sub N is the load sharing ratio. So that basically is, a, again, that value matters. You have to set that equal to something else if you're dealing with helically cut gears. If you're dealing with straight cut gears, the load sharing ratio is just going to be equal to 1. Okay. And that is also listed right below that equation, 1423, there in the book, in case you forget that. All right, now mg, that is just your gear ratio. Okay, so for us, mg is just going to be equal to the number of teeth in the gear over the number of teeth in the pinion. And remember, the pinion is the smaller one, the gear is the larger one. So we're going to put in uh, 48 was the size of our larger gear up here, 48 teeth, and 16 teeth was the number of teeth we had in, in the smaller gear. All right, so that means we can compute this uh, geometry factor for pitting resistance by plugging in the appropriate values. So we put in uh, cosine of 20 degrees, times the sine of 20 degrees over 2 times 1. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mg is equal to 3, not 4. All right. Uh, and then we take this and we multiply it, let's see, by, let's see, 3 over 3 plus 1. Okay, so let's see, we've got cosine of 20 times the sine of 20 over 2 times 3 over 4. So point one two zero five two. <clears throat> which goes right here. All right, so that I think takes care of all the factors that we needed to get our uh, agma contact stress. Okay, and so let's go ahead and punch those in. Let's see, 2284.7. Times the square root of 787.6 times 1 times 1.196 times 1 
times. Okay, k sub m was 1.22. Down in the denominator, we have 2.667 times 2. And then this gets multiplied by the ratio of 1 over 0 0.12052. Okay. <clears throat> and that ends up giving me a value here of 96,598.7. And this is going to be in units of PSI. Okay, one of the ways you know that is that all the factors under the radical right here are unitless with the exception of the force and the face width and the diametral pitch. So that ends up being pounds per square inch and then you take the square root of it. That gets multiplied by the square root of PSI that we have for C sub P and you wind up with um, just PSI. Okay, so that is my AGMA uh, contact stress. Well, what do you think we do with that? Okay, what we're trying to do is come up with a, a factor of safety. And so for the factor of safety question, we need to know a strength. Okay, so we'll go now to the AGMA equation for uh, contact strength. Okay, which is on page 742. Okay, it says that our allowable strength here in contact can be found with a uh, surface strength number, S sub C, uh, or they call it there right below it, the allowable contact stress. We'll fig figure, what, figure out what that is in just a moment. Um, then they have S sub H, which is the factor of safety that we're trying to find. This gets multiplied by ZN. Okay, ZN is the stress cycle factor. We have a different one now for uh, contact relative to uh, bending, which is why it uses a different variable there. Uh, C sub H, okay, C sub H is the hardness ratio factor for pitting resistance. Get to that in just a moment. And then this gets divided by K sub T, which is a temperature factor. That temperature factor um, is not uh, different than what we had earlier. So we'll continue to use the same value there. Um, and then we have K sub R, which is a reliability factor. And again, that is going to be the same value that we already found for the question of bending of teeth. All right. And what we do here is we basically take the amount of uh, stress that we have, right? This contact stress, you plug it in up here and calculate for S sub H. And I'm going to show you here in a moment that that may not be the end of the story uh, with, the, with respect to the question of contact, but um, we'll start with that. So what do you want to find first here? Okay. How about the allowable contact stress number? Okay, for that allowable contact stress number, it again, there's a figure, figure 14.5. And based on the grade of material that we have, we can uh, read along this chart for Brunel hardness. Okay, remember we have a, a 200 Brunel hardness and find what the allowable contact stress number is, or we can use the equation that's also listed on the chart. And the equation says S sub C 
is equal to 322 times the hardness plus 29,100 PSI. <clears throat> All right. And when we punch these things in uh, to find that uh, strength value, got to find it here. There it is. Uh, we get 93,500 PSI. All right, so there's my allowable contact stress number. Next, let's do our uh, Z sub N, okay? Z sub N is, again, that load cycle, the stress cycle factor. We can flip over to that section, okay? And we have... Um, And this section, we have a figure there, figure 1415. And figure 1415 both graphically presents to you a way to find Z sub N for the number of cycles you need to last, um, or it also gives you equations that do the same thing, okay? And uh, if you look at figure 1415, uh, there's a curve there that is the more conservative one again, right? Because the more conservative you go, uh, the lower this Z sub N number is. And when you're above one, uh, excuse me, above 10 to the seventh cycles, um, then you end up seeing that there's this curve that ends up lower, has an equation of 2.466 N. So I'll write that here, 2.466 uh, N, <clears throat> okay, N is the number of cycles, so we'll put in 10 to the 8th, okay, raised to the negative 0 0.056. All right. So when we punch those values in, uh, let's see here. This gives me <clears throat> 0 0.879. Okay, and again, this uh, that value ends up being lower uh, like this. Uh, to, to sort of account for the idea that, that we need 10 to the 8th cycles, right? So that's, that's what that factor accounts for, as opposed to the 10 to the 7th cycles where it was originally rated. All right. So now what we want to do is get C, C sub H. So C sub H, the hardness ratio factor for pitting resistance. Okay. So C sub H is a way that you can, um, if you have two different materials that are mating with each other, right? You have a harder material typically with your pinion and a softer material for your gear. This happens a lot of times because the gear, because it has more teeth and has more teeth, you know, with which to share that uh, effect. Um, what C sub H essentially does is it gives you a factor that allows you to correct for that. Um, and, you know, essentially give your gear the advantage that it really does have, that it has more teeth to share that load, right? But it's also made out of a softer material, typically. So anyway, that's what C sub H does. Since we're doing all of our evaluations for the pinion, not for the gear, this factor doesn't matter to us. Uh, you know, I shouldn't say that. The factor is one if you're dealing with the pinion. 
as opposed to the gear. Okay, and we already had K sub T and K sub R. K sub T, since we're not at elevated temperatures, we just allow that to be one. K sub R was 0.85, I believe, uh, be from before when we were uh, finding that uh, reliability factor for 90%. So what this allows us now to do is to take our stress that we're experiencing, 96,598.7 PSI, and set it equal to 93,500 PSI over this factor of safety we're trying to find, multiplied by 0.879 times 1 over 1 times 0.85. Okay. And out of this, we can get S sub H. Okay. Ultimately, kind of what that just becomes is 93,500 uh, divided by, do it this way, 93,500 divided by 96,598.7. Uh, times 0 0.879 uh, divided by 0.85, which is a close call, all right? 0 0.0009. OK. And that is my factor of safety for contact fatigue but here's something that's a little bit tricky here okay uh, again because there's this effect whenever you have two parts that mate with each other and there's this contact as they begin to deform one another the area increases it makes the relationship between load and uh, you know and stress nonlinear. Okay, so we have a nonlinearity that happens between the load and the amount of stress that it experiences. And in order to resolve that, it actually turns out that um, if you want to have a number that's appropriate uh, to compare with forces and torques and that kind of thing, as opposed to compare with the ratio of stresses, then what you have to do is you have to take this value of S sub H and square it. Okay, so. I'll say factor of safety focused on torques and, and uh, gear force, you know, gear tooth forces and all that. So this is the factor of safety for contact and I'll say focused on stress. Okay, if we want to focus it on uh, things like torque or, or contact force, then S sub H is equal to 1.0009 uh, squared. Okay, which isn't much different because the number is so close to one, uh, 1.0019. Okay, so what I'm basically saying here is that uh, if you want to have a number 
that allows you to determine how much more torque you might be able to apply to the gear train, for instance. You wouldn't want to use the one that's focused on stress. You would want to use the one that's focused on torque or uh, tooth force or tooth uh, contact force. All right. Um, so that's kind of the the use of uh, the AGMA method. All right. Yeah, you got a question. Okay, that is shown. Uh, it doesn't, it's not shown in exactly the form I'm showing it, but it is given on page 757, um, right in the middle of the page, 1443. So I'll say down here, based on equation 1443. Okay. Yeah. So that typically for these types of questions, it will further specify which factor of safety you are trying to find. So the question was, if it's on a homework problem or a test or whatnot, how would you know which of these to use? Um, if it's not stated, you know, which one of them you are supposed to use, then uh, I would basically clarify with me because that's not really supposed to be that way, right? It, I will typically try to give um, more instruction if I'm asking the question and I want you to get a particular answer, I'll give you more instruction about which of them you're supposed to use. Um, you know, in the real world, you should have a pretty good idea of which of them to use based on what you're planning to use the factor of safety number for, right? If you're trying to figure out how close are you to overstressing the material, then you might want to use the one focused on stress. If you're trying to figure out how much more load you might be able to apply or torque you might be able to apply, you would use the one focused on torque or contact force. So it's a little bit less ambiguous for that, but in terms of the problems that you work, um, I will, if it's not given, let me just say it this way, if it's not given, then uh, let me know and I will further instruct you about which one I would like you to use. Any other questions? All right, that was a lot to get through. I appreciate your attention. And so I will see you next time.